sacred religious responses to deep sea bed mining. Um, once again, for those who just logged on, this is a very full and informative panel. We are going to ask for everyone to make sure that their microphone is muted when they are not presenting uh, throughout this event. That way we can increase the audio quality, improve the audio quality for everybody who's watching. Kindly note that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available to all participants after the event. We have six fantastic speakers on the lineup today. And if you're like me, I'm certain you're going to have a number of questions for them. For participants today, we're asking that you use the chat box to ask any questions that might come up throughout the event. If you don't know how to do that, you'll note that on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there'll be a little box that says chat and you can hit it and the chat box will pop up. Yeah, we're asking you to put your questions in the chat throughout because while we do have a live Q&A session built in after all of our speakers have had a chance to present, if anything happens and we go over time, we wanna make sure that everybody's questions can get emailed to our speakers afterwards so that they will have an opportunity to respond in writing if they wish to do so. The Sea is Sacred webinar is sponsored by the NGO Mining Working Group, the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America, VIVAT International, and the Pacific Conference of Churches. And let me extend very deep gratitude to each of our sponsors, and again, to each of our wonderful, wonderful speakers who have gathered here today on St. Peter and Paul's Day to draw attention to an issue that is truly of global importance that impacts the Pacific region most immediately, that threatens the Pacific region most immediately. But as we are all one people united by one ocean, this issue in fact impacts us all. I would like to invite us into an opening moment of prayer. So if you'd be so kind as to center, focus, close your eyes if you would like to. I'll share this prayer from the season of creation. God, our creator, as we reflect on the mysteries of the ocean depths, we celebrate the wondrous design of the seas that surround us. Help us to discern how we have polluted our oceans and to empathize with the groaning of creation beneath us. Teach us to sense the presence of God in the tides and currents of the surging seas. Teach us to care for the oceans and all our waterways. In the name of the wisdom of God, the creative force that designs and governs all creation. Amen. Thank you, everyone. The Sea is Sacred webinar is a virtual side event of the UN Oceans Conference. I'm your moderator for today's event, Blair Nelson, a UN NGO representative of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace. And I have the honor of zooming in from Lisbon at the UN Ocean Conference. On Monday, a global alliance of governments calling for a moratorium on deep sea mining was announced. Palau and Fiji led the way to a standing ovation in response. And yesterday, the Prime Minister of Fiji issued these words. If you breathe oxygen, you have a stake in the Pacific's future. With those words to guide our way, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. His Eminence Cardinal Suani Patita Paini Mafi is the fourth Roman Catholic Bishop of Tonga. In February of 2015, he was appointed by Pope Francis as the first ever Cardinal from Tonga, and he became on that date the youngest member of the College of Cardinals. He has become an eloquent and forceful spokesman for the South Pacific's many vulnerable communities threatened with devastation by climate change. With that, Cardinal Mafi, I invite you to unmute your microphone and share your reflections with us. Thank you, Player. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A big malolele to you all from Tonga. It is an honor to be part of this important occasion. The ocean has been sacred right from the beginning of time, as the creation narrative tells us in the book of Genesis, that God was its creator. When we were kids, we often go out to the beach for a swim, especially on holiday times. But we were often warned by our parents not to make too much noise at the beach or at sea. And the reason was because the waves may get angrier and stronger and harm our lives. It seemed very true for us despite being kids at the time. The more noise we made, the bigger the waves seemed to become. We learned a good lesson. If the sea is just like another living creature to be respected. When our men go out fishing and throwing out their nets or their lines, they not only talk to each other, but they even talk down to the fish in the sea, calling out traditional names on them. It may seem just a humor, but it has become part of the ritual, a habit, a way of life, to just talk to these living creatures. There is a certain sense of mutual friendliness and tenderness between fishermen and sea creatures underwater. I recall as a young boy on calm days when the sea or the lagoon is dead still and crystal clear. I was feeling like being entertained as a child when repeatedly hearing my own echo being carried back and forth in a vibration of sound along the surface of the vast clear ocean. Isn't this like easy sense of playfulness and livelihood freely offered by nature and its natural beauty? The sacredness of the ocean is connected, firstly, to the truth of its divine creator, God himself. And secondly, to the primary purpose it is being made for, the well-being of men and women made in God's image. There is harmony and interconnectedness between God, man, and nature, reflecting a sense of respect in the presence of the sacred. In January 15th this year, a supervolcanic explosion caused much sufferings and destruction to the island and people of Tonga. It was predicted that the accompanying tsunami would have wiped up the entire islands in an instant, but instead it did not happen. Scientists may find some explanation in the future, but for many Tongans, it, this was a work of divine mercy and divine providence. Like in all other Pacific nations, our cultures, spirituality, and identity all flow together as with the sea tides. We see our lives as living without the clo close connections and relationship between God, ourselves, and nature, between our past, present, and future. Such a profound conviction has to be upheld and maintained, for it is truly sacred. The church has a mandate and divine duty of stewardship and custodian of nature and of God's creation. She is to remain faithful to this call. In her approaches, she is guided with biblical divine principles, which have been well integrated in her so-called church social teaching. Her main inspiration has to be centered on human dignity, the preferential options for the poor, and the vulnerable stewardship and the promotion of the common good. This is a baseline for religious responses to deep sea mining. Pope John Paul II in Ecclesia in Oceania had said in 2001, it was the special responsibility of the governments and peoples of Oceania to assume on behalf of all humanity, stewardship of the Pacific Ocean containing over one half of the Earth's total supply of water. The continued health of this and other oceans is crucial for the welfare of peoples, not only in Oceania, but in every part of the world. In his document Laudato Si, Pope Francis says, this sister now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God and endowed her. We have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters entitled to plunder her at will. The violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, 
is also reflected in the symptoms of sickness in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life. Caritas Oceania has documented climate change impacts on Pacific communities, such as more destructive extreme weather events and sea level rise causing erosion, higher tides, and soil salination. Climate change has forced people to move from an atoll based lifestyle to an agricultural based economy, which means additional stress to them and their livelihoods. In Tonga, there are four islands which were relocated, and these coastal fisher families are now forced to be farmers, something that they have no full confidence to do as their source of livelihood. They are being distanced from the ocean, which represents everything for them. And today, perhaps more than ever, Caritas Oceania is concerned with the ocean damage arising from seabed mining, a claim by some as necessary to find the minerals needed to feed the technology required to harness renewable energy. But this seems like diving into the dark Communities in some of the countries backing or standing to be affected by seabed mining are not being adequately informed on what's involved and what the risks are to ocean health and food source. The people need to be appropriately consulted and to know the implication of this industry. Who are these companies and how is this industry going to benefit our people, if at all? We should not be entertaining deep sea mining for its spell doom and destruction to our deep sea ecology and ecosystems. Turning clear blue ocean to a brown black color and polluting water and reef is destroying food sources and livelihoods for local people. This has been the result of the volcanic eruption and consequent tsunami of January 15 in Tonga. The ash fallout covered the whole of Tonga, bearing coastal ecosystems for weeks and months. Interestingly, many Tongans saw the event through the lens of faith and religion. In their minds, it was somehow a blessing in disguise, an opportunity, a call for a moral purification, a time for conversion, an opportunity to re-examine our hearts and minds. Perhaps that this is also the real challenge for the church today in her mission, a consistent and real conversion. Others have seen it as a tough warning and an example for Tonga, that if deep sea mining happens, this will be the reality, a bloom that will rain sediments on all living things, deeming them uneatable for months, even years. Mining in any sorts of form are very destructive. It's unsustainable and it will destroy the environment. There is no way around that. It's just a matter of time before we see the extent of what it can do. Our concern for the ocean stems from our very experience of the poor around the world, especially coastal communities, small island states, and the region of Oceania. We support urgent climate adaptation financed by government and partnered by communities and remote barriers for communities to access climate finance. We would keep up the fight to keep alive the 1.5 degree Celsius Paris Agreement goal and take action to ensure that it is met. We assist to strengthen knowledge sharing across the region, to learn from each other and find common solution for example, on resilience building and early warning systems. A transformation of our social and economic systems is required in an integrated approach that addresses the interrelated environmental, social, and economic crisis we face and restores good relationships between peoples and the earth. We encourage listening to young people, to elders, to indigenous and local peoples, who know their place well, to ensure that all these voices are heard and heeded in problem-solving decision-making and implementation. Creation has given so much for humanity. It provides everything that we need for living. Now is the time for us to act by giving back to nature 
by protecting and saving it for more harm. Climate change has already had a significant impact on ocean and marine ecosystems. It is critical for nations around the world to recognize the urgent need for the conservation, protection, and sustainable use on oceanic, of oceanic biodiversity. We ask to ban further seabed mining and exploration for exploitation. It will damage marine life and ecosystems already under pressure from multiple stresses. Together with our co-partners, the church asks for stronger commitments and actions. From this conference, to strengthen ocean-based action under the UNFCCC multilateral process. We also ask to develop climate response projects based on sound science, indigenous and local knowledge, and with the full participation and involvement of affected communities. Wishing you all well in the rest of the evening. Thank you very much, Malo Abito. Thank you very much for those powerful comments, Cardinal Mafi. Uh, I appreciated how you drew attention back to how deep sea mining violates the preferential option for the poor and most vulnerable, as well as our commitments to care for the common good and to care for creation. Thank you for issuing such a powerful call to the delegates at this conference as well. At this time, I would like to invite to the floor the next speaker, Reverend James Shri Bhagwan, is an ordained minister of the Methodist Church in Fiji. He serves as General Secretary of the Pacific Conference of Churches, which is the region's peak ecumenical body with 33 member churches and 10 national councils of churches across 19 Pacific Island states and territories, accounting for some 80% of the Pacific's human population. Reverend James gives us a unique perspective of human security and climate change focusing on the role of the church, not only in advocating environmental issues, but also in finding practical solutions to those challenges. Reverend Bhagavan, kindly unmute and take the floor. Thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> may I begin by saying aloha, because I am currently in Hawaii, where it's um, just a little after two in the morning. Uh, but it's a pleasure to join you in Lisbon, in the Pacific, and around the world from wherever you are, you are joining. Um, and I also would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land here, the indigenous uh, Kanaka Maoli, people whom God has placed as the guardians of this part of our blue Pacific and this part of God's creation, our common home. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to, to join uh, the community that is gathering in person and online um, as the world's attention focuses on our oceans, even if it's only for a short period of time before the world gets distracted by other things. And I acknowledge our two uh, colleagues from the PCC, uh, Olivia Mbaro, who is present and will be on this panel, and also Mbedi Radule who are uh, our young uh, Pacific Ocean Mama Warriors from the PCC, um, who have been uh, part of our advocacy uh, from the Pacific churches, along with um, His Grace Archbishop Peter Loy Chong, um, who is there on the ground in, in, in Lisbon. For the Pacific Conference of Churches, um, and I, I, I think here I really would like to echo what um, Cardinal Mafi has already said, but to recognize that for Pacific Islanders, for millennia, our ancestors have held this mantle of stewardship of the ocean. The ocean is the living blue heart of our planet. It's our common heritage, but also our common responsibility. We are its guardians and we recognize its significance and its essence as the basis of our Pacific identity and well-being, and from a Christian perspective, also as part of our Christian Pacific identity and well-being. And particularly for Pacific Islanders, we are the ocean, and in its preservation, we also are preserved. And for millennia, um, we have embedded the wisdom of our ancestors, their resource management, their conservation practices into culture and traditions. 
And just as our faith calls us to think of the kingdom, or from a kingdom perspective, the kingdom of God, the household of God, as we use it in the Pacific um, uh, terminology, our vision of the ancestors was always beyond their temporal needs. The survival and well-being of future generations was central to their view of the world. And as custodians uh, of the responsibility to protect the ocean against exploitation and destruction in our time, we have a moral obligation and a long-standing legacy to uphold. Our forebear, the forebears have on this frontier stood firm against the ruinous incursions of nuclear testing, drift net fishing, and bottom trawling and marine pollution. And against impossible odds, they united to move a world to adopt a nuclear test ban treaty, a ban on drift net, net uh, fishing, and the London Dumping Convention. Awareness of the connections between climate change and the health of our oceans gathers momentum globally. And deep sea mining is the latest in the long list of destructive industries to be thrust into our sacred ocean. It is a new perilous frontier extractive industry being falsely promoted, particularly to Pacific Islands as uh, those who are seen to still be developing, to be the proven answer to our economic needs. And this has been um, entrenched more so in the context of COVID-19. And while its promised benefits remain speculative, its pursuit is insidious. Even at the experimental stage, deep sea mining, DSM, is already proving harmful to our Pacific communities, to livelihoods, cultural practices, and our well-being. The PCC um, has and continues to advocate for a total ban on deep sea mining within our territorial waters and in areas beyond our natural jurisdiction. And um, here I, I, I want to um, reflect also that um, on uh, later this week, towards the end of the, um, the Lisbon meeting in, um, on, on oceans, a, um, a, um, a video is going to be released called Blue Peril, which is a visual investigation of deep sea mining in the Pacific. And this, um, this visual investigation puts into very clear visual understanding the impact of deep sea mining taking place even beyond our, our, um, our natural borders, our, uh, beyond our um, biodiversity jurisdiction, the BBNJ, as we, we often say. And so um, while we continue to call for a ban of deep sea mining, we do applaud the, um, the call by many of our Pacific Island countries for a moratorium. It is a start, at least, to apply the precautionary principle around deep sea mining. That, and this precautionary principle was, was something that the UN um, Oceans Conference in 2017 raised. And, um, you know, uh, the PCC since 2017 um, in the context of uh, Papua New Guinea, where deep sea mining was really about to, um, to, to begin, um, really spoke out quite strongly on this. We continue to raise this issue. We are very grateful to our sisters and brothers in Tuvalu who had triggered the start of a process to, um, um, to begin deep sea mining, but later on withdrew from it as our civil society and churches explained the issues around deep sea mining. So already we can see that, um, you know, to use an oceanic term, the tide is turning. And we need to change this turning tide into a tsunami that is actually in the favor of the Pacific Islands, rather than something that's going to wash into our region and, and, um, and cause, um, cause problems for us in the long term. Uh, we need to also learn um, that the, the same promises of social and economic and environmental benefits to our people that are being touted for deep sea mining also were promised for land-based mining. And we can see how the extractive industries on land have shown, you know, have turned out. And so we really need to stand firm in terms of our commitment and our role from a Christian perspective as 
uh, fellow guardians of God's creation. We are part of that creation. So by preserving the, the sea as sacred, by preserves, preserving the land, we are also preserving ourselves, but also to recognize that indigenous people um, and all people have the right of free prior and informed consent. And so our Christian spirituality, our Pacific indigenous spirituality and the spirituality of all indigenous communities around the world is very clear on this, that deep sea mining is something that is not needed. And it is also something that is not wanted by our communities. And this is something where we as people of faith, uh, which has the power to mobilize so many people across our planet, need to really step up and advocate for. So I really want to um, thank you once again for the opportunity to be on this panel, and I look forward to the questions as we go through. Minaka. Thank you very much, Reverend Bhagavan, for those powerful words. I particularly appreciate the attention that you drew to the efforts to pass a global moratorium on deep sea mining and how time sensitive this issue truly is. The International Seabed Authority could um, approve operations to begin as early as next month, July or August. So truly this conference in this moment is a time to galvanize support around this issue. It is now my pleasure to welcome our next speaker to the floor. Avery Davis Lamb is co-executive director of Creation Justice Ministries. Through its 38 denominational and communion members, Creation Justice Ministries serves about 100,000 churches and 45 million people in the United States. Avery has a background in both ecological research and faith-based environmental organizing studying ecology in various ecosystems and organizing faith communities across the country in support of action on environmental justice. Avery, thank you for joining us today. Kindly unmute and take the floor. Great, thank you, Blair. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you, Cardinal Moffey and Reverend Bhagwan for getting us started today with those, those powerful words. I have a few slides that I'm gonna share with you all today. So we'll get that going. Again, as Blair said, my name is Avery Davis Lamb. I'm a co-executive director of Creation Justice Ministries. I am zooming in to you today from Durham, North Carolina, the, um, the home of the, the Okanichi, Saponi, and Lumbee people who are the, the caretakers placed here by God to take care of, of this place um, in the United States, of course. So it's, uh, it's about 8 a.m. here. So uh, a true gift to be gathered with folks from around the world um, in this virtual space. Uh, I'm based in Durham, as I said. Uh, Creation Justice Ministries is based in Washington, D.C., in the, the United Methodist Building, which is right across from the Capitol Building, um, really in the heart of where decisions are made uh, here in the U.S. I wanted to share just a moment the mission of Creation Justice Ministries as a grounding for um, some of my thoughts about deep sea bed mining. Our mission is to educate, equip, and mobilize Christians to protect, restore, and rightly share God's creation. As Blair mentioned in the introduction, we are an ecumenical organization. We actually originally came from the National Council of Churches here in the United States, and we still operate in a very similar fashion. We work with 38 different member communions and denominations ranging across, across the Christian traditions. And to give you a sense of the communities who are a part of our network, here's a list of, of our members, the denominations and communions that make up our membership. I know I'm not leaving this up long enough for you to see all of them, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the range of Christians that we are working with here in the United States around issues of creation care and creation justice. I want to start today with a reading from Jeremiah 31, 35. The Lord proclaims, the one who established the sun to light, up the day and ordered the moon and stars to light up the night, who stirs up the sea into crashing waves, whose name is the Lord of heavenly forces. At Creation Justice Ministries, we call the ocean God's marine creation. 
And that's a reminder for us because here in the US, where many communities are not ocean-based communities, where many communities are inland, are seemingly disconnected from the ecology and the economy and the household of the ocean, as Reverend Bhagwan shared, the ocean can be forgotten in conversations on creation care and creation justice. So often in the US, I find that our conversations about our role as caretakers of this world can turn toward the terrestrial and forget the marine. But we know that God loves the ocean. We know that God created the ocean and its beautiful diversity. And we read here that God stirs up the sea into crashing waves. And in the ocean, we see the heavenly forces. In the New Testament, as we read in the Christ hymn in Colossians, Creation is held together and sustained by Christ. The ocean is held together and sustained by Christ. The ocean teaches us a bit about the heavenly forces of God and of Christ. And in the ocean, we can see the face of God. The second place in the Bible that I want to turn to is in Job. And I think. God's response to Job's questioning when God is in the whirlwind and drawing attention to God's power is particularly provocative when we think about issues of deep seabed mining and other extractive issues. So I, I, you know, I, I want to highlight the, the poetry that's in Job, which is one of the oldest books of the Bible. Some, some scholars believe that it was the first book of the Bible that was written. So there's this um, this almost primordial um, nature that is expressed here, and yet that still speaks truth to us today. So join me in this reading from Job 38, verses 16 through 18. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. I, I come to you not as an expert on deep seabed mining, nor from a community that is directly affected by deep seabed mining, but I do come to you as a Christian, as someone who believes that God is the creator of the ocean and reads this passage um, with, with, uh, with curiosity and, and with faith. And when I read in verse 16, or sorry, in verse 18, have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the depth? What I hear there is, is have we comprehended the expanse of the earth? Have we really considered what is there on the seabed? Do we know the creatures of God, the pieces of God's creation that are in the depths of the sea? The answer a lot of the time is no, that the deep sea is one of the places where science is yet to know about, about the life down there, that we, we, we haven't comprehended the expanse of the ocean because we, we can't. And yet our response to, um, our response to the expanse is not to glorify and worship God, but when it comes to deep sea mining, it's to mine the body of the earth. Instead of, of being in awe of the glory that might be on the seafloor, the response from industries is to extract anything we can take of value from the vault of life that is in the ocean. The deep sea is one of the few places 
where humans are yet to explore the beauty and abundance of life. I'm excited for the day when we can see and understand the pieces of God's creation that are living in amazing ecosystems adapted to the seafloor. And so how selfish are we to blindly extract without even knowing the life that lives in those habitats? What I think Job shows us and the reading from Jeremiah is that the seafloor is a sacred space. The seafloor is an important part of God's creation. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not sacred. And that means that deep seabed mining is a desecration, a desecration of God's sacred creation. As I transition to speaking a bit more specifically about some of the issues around deep seabed mining, I, I, I want to ground my thoughts in our mission at Creation Justice Ministries, which I shared earlier, but bring back up here to highlight the call in our mission to protect, restore, and rightly share God's creation. These are sacred tasks that we are set to as humans on this earth. I like to think of these as our ecological, economic, and eschatological duties. We are to protect the ecology, restore, because we have a sense of eschatological duty, both now and as we look toward the end, and rightly share, of course, recognizing that all issues of creation are economic issues. Economy, sharing that same Greek root, as household, the oikos, as well as ecumenical. So it's about caring for our household here. So let's start by talking about protecting. We believe that species are inherently worthwhile, that God's creation is created out of love, and it's hubris to destroy the habitats of species we can't even see. We know that previous attempts at deep seabed mining have absolutely decimated habitats. We know that this is a destructive practice that will cause irreparable damage. That's the nature of mining, particularly it's the nature of mining blindly, like we would be doing with deep seabed mining. It's an extractive practice that destroys without building up. The second is that we're called to restoration and that right now, really now more than ever, we need restoration and not extraction. In a time of climate change, we need restoration of ecosystems because those ecosystems help regulate the carbon cycle. They help buffer our communities and buffer the community of creation from the worst impacts of climate change. And as both Cardinal Mafi and Reverend Bogwan highlighted, if we expect to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need all of the help from God's creation that we can get, and that includes the seafloor. We know that deep seabed mining disturbs biological systems on the seafloor that are central to the cycling and regulation of carbon in our world. That the ocean is inextricably related to carbon cycling. In fact, the ocean is the most important carbon sink in our world, and the seabed is an inextricable piece of that cycle. And so we ought to be restoring parts of creation that are being destroyed rather than continuing to extract from them. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, is uh, to rightly share God's creation. And what I wanna say is that this is a justice issue Deep seabed mining puts at risk the livelihoods of most vulnerable communities. Cardinal Mafi highlighted this and Reverend Bogwan did. And from a US perspective, our government has leverage that it can use to prevent deep seabed mining. As Reverend Bogwan said, the tide is turning and so the US must take a clear stance on this justice issue. So I wanna end with a call to the Biden administration to say, um, 
to use your full diplomatic and economic leverage to support the moratorium that we heard being presented by the leaders at the UN Ocean Conference to pause issuing exploration and exploitation permits and to commit to source critical materials through sustainable practices. This is a spiritual issue, a climate issue and a justice issue. And so this is my call to the leaders here in the United States. Thank you. Excellent, Avery. Thank you very much. I particularly appreciated you presenting us with a scriptural relationship with the ocean that emerged from a desert people. You know, even from them, we find a relationship to the deep, which is crucial to our spirituality. It is now my pleasure to welcome our fourth speaker, Tivita Naikusualu. He is a coordinator for justice, peace, and integrity of creation for the Columban mission in Fiji under the Oceania region. He is also an HEIR defender, which stands for Human Ecological Indigenous Rights Defender in Fiji, which is a network he founded to uphold values on humanity, care for ecology, and protect the rights of indigenous people, which are the three main challenges that the Oceania region faces. And as I learned at the beautiful Oceana Talanoa event organized yesterday, he is also a very talented and moving musician. Tivita, you are warmly welcome to unmute your microphone and take the floor. Um, to friends and excellencies uh, that um, have uh, spoken, uh, Reverend Baguan, uh, Cardinal Mafi. Um, uh, from uh, the Christian ministry, thank you very much. You have set the platform for our theological and spiritual foundation. For me, I would like to go straight uh, into the contextual part of it. Um, we here in Fiji, uh, in the Archdiocese of Suva, uh, uh, we have Caritas Fiji and the Colombian mission. Uh, to reflect this uh, issue on deep sea mining, we are standing up and fighting against river and foreshore mining. This is a, a, a reflection of what deep sea mining is, because um, currently it's happening now in Fiji. Uh, Fiji is the only place where uh, uh, foreshore mining, this is mining of the foreshore, and the concept is somewhat similar to deep sea. You have a ship, you have a uh, a dredge that go down and 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 suck up and disrupt the 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 bed of the sea and it sucked up to a sea it's uh, separated then the whatever that is wasted is again thrown back into the sea this is currently here in fiji and uh, we have been fighting very much uh, hard uh, and standing up against this uh, on, on a coastal sea here in ba and singatoka which is also at the periphery of our deep sea, because the concept is similar. Uh, in deep sea, you, you, we lower down a vehicle that goes down to pick up these noodles and disrupt the, uh, the seabed and brings it up, sucks it up, and then separates, then the rest is thrown back. Uh, last month, uh, two weeks, uh, we went again to visit where this is happening here in Bar. What has happened, the, the whole seabed uh, in Bar has been turned around. It has been completely destroyed because it's sucked up by these huge dreads. It's gone onto a separator and the, the, the remnants are pumped back into the sea. I actually went there um, last month to go and see that there are huge uh, two-story um, mounds of the sand that has been pumped up from the sea. And, um, and you can see uh, the sea around it uh, has lost its blueness. It's all that murky, um, uh, mudded, uh, bleak looking sea. And this is at the mouth of the Mba River. I'm, I'm putting this in context because this is some, something that is similar that will happen to in, the, in, the, in deep sea when these uh, huge plumes of dust and waste are pumped back into the sea. It's a, a tremendous crime because it kills mercilessly everything that's in its path. Small cramps, uh, uh, shrimps, clams, fishes, uh, turtles, nests, 
interesting uh, that's uh, that's all there uh, and uh, the dust uh, the sea the 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 sea dust that is pumped out of in is uh, it is taken by the currents of the rivers and uh, and the waves to to the mangroves and you can see this uh, this terrible um, uh, after effects uh, and it has changed the whole um, ecosystem and it has also changed the whole behavior of how uh, women men and other communities who are fishermen um, uh, have tried to live. They have lost a lot of, um, uh, of livelihood in terms of their daily sustenance and their income because where they used to uh, go out to fish, they can no longer because um, it's been totally destroyed and uh, they have to go out further and deeper. And, uh, well, and this is the type of effect that will be multiplied in our deep ocean, if we do not stand up strongly uh, and speak out and say no to it, uh, while, uh, while we have um, uh, we have strongly supported uh, the stand on a total ban uh, for deep sea mining, because here we are seeing that right in front of us, and we and uh, I can be witness to what uh, could be reality if we. They allow this to happen in our deep sea because like um, there are many, many informations that have been shared out on we do not know much. There is need to be more scientific. Yes, that is true. But here in front of us in Fiji, we are witnessing um, a contextual uh, uh, scenario that is similar to deep sea. And I call on our government and I call on the government of Fiji while uh, I, am, I applaud them for standing up for uh, our government and our prime minister for the first uh, Total uh, for not total uh, for the moratorium for the next ten years. I also call for our government to extend this not only from the deep sea, it is from to, from the mountain, with, which has been mined now to our rivers, to our foreshores, and the current uh, uh, explore, explore, uh, explorations that have been done all around the uh, all around Fiji in Fiji waters and the Fiji for, uh, shoreline. Uh, so that they can stop this, because if we just uh, have a total ban on uh, on uh, on seabed and we do not ban mining on our land and foreshore, and of course uh, we have because th these uh, impacts are immediate and people are already affected by it right now. So that's my call, and that's what I'm sharing now with uh, we in in Fiji, the Archdiocese of Suva. Uh, uh, Carriers and the Colombians, which is stand for justice, peace, and integrity of creation, of course the voice of indigenous people, because the deep sea, what, what, what's, what's very upsetting about the, the talk about deep sea, because it's far away from us. And if uh, the deep sea is um, our common heritage, our common responsibility, it must be also for our common good. And so that means everybody must be involved in the consultation, the coastal people, women, children, youth, not only government and the corporations under the ISA, so that is why we are calling on now and our government as, uh, because it has already so that it can put this uh, or for to stop this and we thank you the, for to the church and the voice of faith uh, uh, voice of uh, uh, indigenous people and vulnerable communities from bringing this this up because we need deep knowledge we need the deep meditation deep observation deep understanding deep respect deep wisdom in order to attain deep love, which we'll find God in order for us to have a deep connection with the sea. And we, in, in, in that, we shall have a deep relationship and it will guide our hearts and our hands not to harm this wonderful creation of God. Thank you. Thank you, Tabita, for your moving firsthand testimony of many of the harms of extractive practices of all kinds, reminding us that a threat to water anywhere is a threat to water everywhere. And that, in fact, water as our common heritage is something that we must all be involved in protecting. It is not just the purview of governments and the ISA. And thank you for the reminder that we do this work ultimately out of a deep love for this water that, that unites us all. Our next speaker is Sister Wendy Flannery. She is a member of the Institute of Sisters of Mercy of Australia and Papua New Guinea. She's a longtime advocate for justice, peace, and the integrity of creation. 
From 2003 until the present, she has been based in Brisbane, Australia, and involved in a number of social and environmental justice and peace building projects and programs. Sister Wendy, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the floor and invite you to unmute as I pull up your PowerPoint. Thank you very much, Blair. And thank you to all the amazing speakers who have already shared with us this evening. Um, I hope I'm not going to repeat uh, what, what's been said already, uh, but maybe to add a, a few more ideas. Um, I really love maps, and so I'm going to start with a map, but start by saying that, um, uh, sh showing you where I live. So you can see the, the continent of Australia, a big continent. Uh, I live about halfway down the, the east coast on the land of the Jagera people, south of the Maywa Brisbane River. And um, I've been, that's where I was born and that's where I keep returning. Uh, so uh, you can see on that map, the continent of Australia, but you can also see uh, all the Pacific Island nations marked with, with boundaries. And that's a very common map that, that um, that people look at to look at the Pacific. Uh, I, just to say about myself that, that because the most of Australians do live on the coastal areas and particularly on the East Coast, uh, that I did grow up with a great love for the ocean. Uh, from very small childhood, we swam, we fished, we, we jumped out of the water when the sharks came in. Uh, we watched the porpoises leaping in, in the sea. And so the ocean has been a part of my life since, since early childhood, really. Uh, and so when I had the opportunity to work in the Pacific was when I uh, developed a totally different and deeper appreciation of the ocean. So if you could show the next map, the next slide. Yes, so uh, th that's a different map from the one you've just looked at, showing the uh, exclusive economic zones, ocean zones of uh, the Pacific Island countries and the whole of Oceania really. Uh, and um, it's referred to now in Pacific circles as the Blue Pacific Continent. Uh, so not just terrestrial continents, but you can actually think about an ocean continent. And you can see how the ocean connects people all over the Pacific. And that's been so critical uh, in Pacific life. Uh, okay, so um, you've heard already from the Pacific speakers, the importance of the ocean for, for life and culture and spirituality. Uh, my next uh, idea is about uh, the ocean from a planetary perspective. So if we could look at the next slide, um, significance of the ocean for planetary life, source of the building blocks of life on planet Earth, critical in the sustenance of all life on Earth, providing oxygen, food, livelihoods, highways, leisure, a source of psychological and spiritual revival, containing an unknown number and variety of amazing creatures. And we know that, of that all life on planet Earth originated from the ocean. And that's what makes the despoilation of the ocean such a tragic thing and makes us convinced of the necessity of ocean advocacy. So now moving on to deep sea mining. Uh, the next slide, please, Blair. Okay, so these are the arguments that are used for the, in, in favor of deep sea mining that the minerals will play a critical role in the renewable energy revolution, which we need to combat the climate emergency. So we have to ask about that claim. Uh, will this be at the expense of nature? Will it be another case of gambling with the health of the ocean? We're already seeing the impacts of over-extraction, over-exploitation and serious pollution by industrial fishing fleets operating outside territorial waters. 
Secondly, the, the International Seabed Authority is working on global rules for deep seabed mining and has already issued licenses for exploration and potential mining for more than 1 million square kilometers of the ocean floor. But the intensity of such activities could remove entire habitats, wipe out species that we don't even know about. And there's a very broad consensus in the scientific community that knowledge of the ocean deeps and their life forms is still very limited. And the endorsement of, of deep sea mining activities represents another example of gambling with the health of the ocean. And then thirdly, uh, the ISA has a very representative decision-making process. And is, this is a claim that's made. Uh, and his key role is to organize, regulate, and control all mineral related activities in the international seabed area for the benefit of mankind as a whole. That's actually in their charter. So uh, the question is apart from the question of capacity for regulation in, in the vast specific outside territorial boundaries. Um, we have to ask such questions as, will this activity give priority to meeting the needs of the one fifth of the global population that still has no access to electricity whatsoever? So how can it be claimed to benefit mankind as a whole is a question we have to ask. Thank you, the next slide. So the way it works. Uh, mining companies are setting up subsidiaries in countries adjacent to mining locations and any liability for damage or disaster will fall back on them. And, and this is the case of countries in the Pacific uh, who have already, which have already set up subsidiaries for a Canadian mining company, just to take an example. Um, uh, we're already well aware, of course, as someone has already mentioned, of the failure of companies responsible for large terrestrial mining projects to rehabilitate uh, the land after the devastation they've caused. So, uh, you know, to expect that this would happen with deep sea mining is, is also a, a false dream. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the, the uh, Activities are presented as a new source of income for the host nation. And in some cases, additional funding for local projects is provided. Um, uh, so, and then thirdly, some Pacific Island nations have already opened the door to deep sea mining. They may seem far away from their neighbors, but we have to remember that the ocean is a living, moving being and all its mysteries are still beyond the scope of human understanding. The next slide, please, thank you. Now to move to some critical reflections and key principles at stake. So first of all, use of the ocean by market forces, more and more huge and technically sophisticated industrial methods of ransacking and polluting the ocean similar to the way we have used the earth. Uh, an Australian scientist has said, we must end a command and control relationship with the environment if we are to arrest its destruction. Uh, Pope Francis is in his now famous encyclical Laudato Si identifies the fundamental issue when he calls for restoring humans to their rightful place putting an end to their claim of dominion over the earth. He maintains that the establishment of a legal framework which can set clear boundaries and ensure the protection of ecosystems has become indispensable. And thirdly, according to a preparatory material for the current World Oceans Conference, the ocean holds the key to an equitable and sustainable path for all. Finally, uh, I want to bring up some human rights issues in relation to deep sea mining. The next slide, please, Blair. 
So the UN Human Rights Commission has established the position of a special rapporteur on the right to a clean, safe, healthy and sustainable environment. For small island and coastal peoples, this decisively includes the ocean. And um, it's very encouraging to see that the uh, UN Human Rights Commission with that special rapporteur and now with a new special rapporteur on human rights and climate change are really pushing for coast, the rights of small island and coastal peoples uh, in the environmental uh, um, context. Uh, secondly, I just want to mention the rights of nature movement that many of you will have heard about, uh, which started about 10 years ago. And it's already led to the allocation of special rights to rivers in certain locations. Um, I just want to mention that I've just discovered that, um, uh, well, the right itself, it recognizes nature's right to exist, persist and regenerate its life cycles. And the latest nation to introduce these rights into its legal system is Panama. And Panama actually includes the oceans, the rights of the ocean, as well as rivers, trees and mountains. So I think that's, uh, um, that's something that we can put more thought into and see how that movement can be extended as well. And then um, as uh, somebody has already mentioned the precautionary principle. Uh, do the circumstances demand reviving that principle, which argues for a, a lack of full scientific evidence is grounds for postponing activities to prevent degradation of the environment, where there are threats of serious or irreversible environmental damage. And the last slide, thank you. Uh, and this is um, information that's, that's already been mentioned. Um, uh, Caritas Oceania uh, and the reports that come out from that, that body, that collective of, of uh, people. If we look after the earth, our common home, earth would look after us. And they have actually called for a total ban on further seabed mining and exploration. Uh, another group that's uh, very active and uh, has put on events already in the Oceans Conference and been associated with some of the other events, the Deep Sea Community Coalition. Uh, an international network focusing on plans for a Canadian company to mine in the Pacific and calling for a moratorium. And then of course, you've got the groups of Pacific Island leaders, including the Pacific Island Parliamentarians Alliance, who may have also been involved uh, in the Oceans Conference uh, uh, on deep sea mining and the Pacific Elders Voice as well. Uh, and the call of the Alliance to stop deep sea mining is strong and well argued. And so uh, just to end with their opening statement, if I could have the final slide. The ocean is the living blue heart of our planet. It is our common heritage, but also our common responsibility. We are its guardians. We recognize its significance and its essence as the basis of our Pacific identity uh, and well being. We are the ocean. In its preservation, we are preserved. And I think we could say that for the whole global community. Uh, and I'd just like to conclude with a statement that uh, I heard, I don't know, a long time ago and that I think is very appropriate to this context. Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I think that really sums up for me what's happening with this push for deep sea mining. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Wendy, for that informative overview of the issue, particularly for bringing up some of the industry talking points.
such as in order to have a renewable energy future, we need to engage in this exploitative and destructive process. When in fact, we can, need to have a future that is as blue as it is green. And through technological innovation and recycling of minerals, we in fact do not need to sacrifice one for the other. In fact, it is immoral to turn the Pacific into the next sacrifice zone. I would now like to warmly welcome our final speaker of this panel to the floor, Olivia Barrow. She is the ecumenical youth enabler for engagement and empowerment of the Pacific Conference of Churches. And I know that she has been active throughout this conference here in Lisbon. And we are so grateful to include a youth perspective into today's proceedings. Olivia, kindly unmute. Thank you so much, uh, Blair. Mbulabunaka, everyone. A Pacific warm greetings from uh, Lisbon. I acknowledge the powerful and amazing speakers who have uh, spoken before me. Um, as uh, Blair mentioned, I am uh, Olivia Mbarro. And this morning, I would like to begin and share a story about a little girl. This little girl was raised in her grandmother's village on an island surrounded by oceans. She grew up collecting seashells, hot clams with her grandma and her older sister. And this was her routine every Saturday in preparation for Sunday lunch. The ocean became her everything. It was her source of livelihood, her playground, means of transportation, and a place where she can easily disappear to for strength and assurance. Growing up with, with just her grandmother and sister was a challenge, but but also a blessing. They grew up learning that despite the situation, they had to resist and persevere. This is a reality in most of our Pacific community. We depend on our oceans and our land. It is all we have and it's part of who we are. We have our own totems that identify us to our fish, our plant. When a child is born, the umbilical cord of a child is planted into the land or the ocean that provide a deeper connection of identity and symbolizes sacredness once have with their land and sea. This sacred sea is under threat today from nothing else but human greed. We are living in a world where nothing is enough. We continue to want more. Our Pacific community is at the forefront of climate change, sea level rise, intensifying and frequent cyclones irregular weather patterns, earthquakes, flooding, coral breaching. The Pacific has new nuclear legacy with a threat of nuclear waste seeping into the ocean. Our marine biodiversity is under threat. The continued illegal fishing and pollution in our water cannot be managed. And again, our sacred sea is yet again under threat with the possibility of allowing deep sea mining. How much more do we want to extract from our children's livelihood and identity? The liquid continent has no boundaries. Our sacred sea is not a testing ground, a dumpster, or where you explore and experiment. 20 years later, that little girl <laughs> has grown up. The shore where she walked with her grandmother looking for Sunday lunch are now bare. Too hard for anything to live and thrive. Pretty soon, the sea will come to claim the place where she grew up. This is the story for every Pacific Island I speak for. By continuing to submit half-hearted sentiments and continuing to pollute in the pursuit of progress and profit. You rob us of our mother, you rob us of our childhood, you rob us of our future, you rob us of our home. Thank you. Olivia, thank you so much for your story and for reminding us, as several speakers have done today, that what's at stake when we talk about the oceans is in fact ourselves. As we are the ocean, this is a personal issue and personal stories are important as we go forward. Even your tears remind me that we are salt water walking around on land. And, and that when we talk about the oceans and talk about our children's future, that in fact must be what guides our values 
in our decision making. Noting the time, it is 2.14 Lisbon time. We have a, a little over 10 minutes for question and answers from the floor. At this time, I would like to invite any uh, audience members today to use the raise hand feature in order to ask your questions. And if any of my co-event uh, organizers see any questions in the chat that they would like to jump in and share, please do so. If you do not know where the raise hand function is on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little button with a smiley face that says reactions. When you click on it, there should be a second button that says raise hand. So please feel free to click that if you have a question for our panelists. I, I don't see any hands, but I am more than happy. Ooh, we do have one from Reverend James, but I am more than happy also to, um, oh, Reverend, Reverend James, are you able to, do you have a question? I, I'm not a question. I just wanted to respond to something that um, <clears throat> Archbishop uh, Peter Loy Chong of, uh, mm. of Fiji and the Pacific um, put in the chat group uh, in the chat just uh, during um, during the presentations and uh, I just want to reaffirm what he said about uh, the type of languages that we need to recognize need to be heard and he shared this I believe um, um, earlier this week or yesterday or today depending on your time zone um, you know, around the, the spiritual language, the symbolic language, the artistic language, the indigenous language. And too often, um, we are just focusing uh, and at these, at these conversations, uh, at these international meetings, it is only the political and the policy language. Um, in our work with civil society, we are hearing or well, we are given the space to express both our spiritual, symbolic, uh, indigenous language, as well as our political and uh, policy languages. And I think that's important. We really need to ensure that uh, when we talk about inclusive language, it's not only kept to being gender inclusive language, that it is truly the languages that we all speak, the languages of our minds, but also the language of our hearts. Thank you. Here, here, Reverend Bhagavan, thank you. Nikki, do you want to jump in and conclude your thoughts from before? Um, no, I see Archbishop Chong had his, um, his hand up before mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, oops. <laughs> Just want to follow up on uh, James, what James has commented to uh, some of the notes that I put up now. Um, the, the the symbolic well let me begin with what most a lot of theologians and uh, not only theologians but other people have said, uh, said about how faith is communicated so faith has a symbolic uh, structure because and for us as uh, in trying to define our church response or spiritual response or theological response uh, we have to ground our a response on uh, what what we do, and that is uh, speak about God. And how, so ba uh, basically, it's uh, how do we speak about God in the midst of uh, climate change and uh, seabed mining and other mining. And so we can only speak about God through analogical uh, references. That means symbols, and because nobody has seen God, so. We have to find a, a symbol that speaks uh, powerfully to to vulnerable peoples, the peoples of uh, Oceania and other oceans. Eh? So that's why uh, the task for us is to you know to how how we engage on this level. Uh, time is not uh, enough here for me to go uh, in detail, but basically that's. Uh, the task uh, before us. Uh, now, somebody has said he doesn't agree with the spiritual uh, language being involved in the in the in this response. But this is uh, the platform. This is the methodology for 
talking about God and uh, we must get involved because the climate change is a moral issue. And we, as churches, we can, uh, this is our, our area of work. And uh, so uh, uh, a symbol of God that I have uh, put down there is uh, from a woman, Dorothy Soele, who lived in very vulnerable times in uh, German during the, the uh, uh, Holocaust. So very briefly, his language is a silent kind. We, we, you know, uh, which, what she's saying, God cannot represent, is, should not, uh, if God is all powerful, that carries a lot of uh, colonial and, uh, you know, uh, power and for, uh, you know, with domestic violence is not a good language. So she chooses his silent cry, which allows for people to participate in the cry. So if God is all powerful, then there's almost like, okay, leave it up to God. But God has silent cry, then it allows room for us to participate. And I think this is what we, this is the call for us all churches to participate, collaborate, work together, NGOs. And this is what I've been talking to the NGOs that I meet in this conference, is that we, when we get back to Fiji, we need to sit down, work together, collaborate, uh, and then, you know, make God's cry be heard in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments, Archbishop Chung. We do have time for some more questions. I, I do have a question um, for the speakers, if that's okay. Um, so I am, I represent the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America and our uh, patriarch is His Holiness, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew. And, you know, as I think all of the speakers mentioned, each one of us really is almost like a microorganism, you know, of within the oceans, as Blair mentioned, we're all made up of, of salt water and, um, you know, his All Holiness, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, has said, you know, every person in the world is, in essence, a miniature ocean. And that it's the responsibility of all of us as state and religious leaders, communities, individuals, corporations, industries, to provide sustainable, clean, and safe water for the future of all our cities, citizens, for all the people, the animals, the planet. And you know, so many religious leaders like His Holiness, like all of you, all of our wonderful panelists today, speak out for the conservation of our oceans and waterways. But for many of the political leaders, these issues exist elsewhere, somewhere often across the sea, and the work is that of other people. So my question to you is how do we convince them that it is all of our jobs, that it's their job, as Avery, you know, made the call to our President Biden, uh, you know, do they need to physically go and see what it's like as Tavita, as, as you did? Is that what it'll take for them to actually realize that this affects not only other people, but, but us as well? Thank you. Any of our panelists who wish to respond to Nikki's question, be on mute and do so. Okay, I'll give it a shot. Um, I think I drank some coffee before this, so my brain is firing a little bit uh, on seven cylinders instead of four. Um, I, 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 I recognize um, what you've shared, Nikki, and, and I think also the there's the call for what we often hear from the ecumenical patriarch uh, around metanoia call for repentance and that repentance really needs to be factored into the recognition that um, what we are doing is an ecological sin um, and I think that's something we we need to to engage in and, and I see Cardinal Mafi has put a comment also in the in the chat group but uh, I, I, I want to say that I think um, to assume that they don't know because they're uh, away from the situation is not an excuse anymore. When 
all these decisions are based on satellite readouts on the most they ha, these people have the access to more data and information than we could ever hope um, what we connect what we get our uh where we get this from is from our spiritual connection our our indigenous our spiritual connection to to the ocean and so we feel it um, and I think that's that's part of what's missing, that the, there is a recognition, and, and I think Avery referred to this, there, the sacred cords that bound our ecology, economy, and ecumenicity have been broken. And so we need to work to reweave those cords. So there's a, there's a prophetic aspect of what we're doing today um, in, that, in the terms of the advocacy, but there is also a need for the pastoral work for us to do. There is a need to, to work on the souls, uh, to, to use that, again, our faith language um, of those who, who are in that space of decision making. And um, I think that, you know, uh, Archbishop Chong has also referred to this as a moral call. But I think we also have to recognize that there is a premise that is being put that um, uh, deep sea mining is a being proposed as, as an answer, and we've heard this also from, from Sister Wendy, uh, the answer to our climate uh, finance woes, to our development finance woes. We need to push for the alternatives of development, which we in the Pacific already have as part of our, our indigenous uh, way of living and is promoted as our Christian way of living. I'm very concerned that with the focus on blue economy and, and those sorts of things, it's almost a shift from the, the old uh, philosophy of terra nullius to now looking at mare nullius because the ocean is seen as, as empty of people. But the ocean for us is not just full of life, it is alive. And so we need to recognize that, um, that interconnectivity. It's very easy to start preaching on this topic. Thank you very much. Powerful words, the ocean is alive. Thank you, Reverend Bhagwan. We have time for one more question from Paul from Vivat, whose hand is raised. Paul, can you unmute and share your thoughts? Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentations from the speakers. Uh, this, the world leader, all political leaders are now gathering in this world to talk about oceans. My question is what? Are your message? What are your core messages and acts sent to them in relation to the climate change and deep sea mining? And also, what are your acts and messages to your national leaders and leaders in the regional, uh, in, uh, regional uh, regions in your place? What are your acts to them and what your core messages sent to them in this day? Thank you. Thank you for your question, Paul. There was a little bit of feedback, so I want to make sure that all our panelists heard the question. In a sense, it is what is your takeaway message for each of the representatives who are here at the UN Ocean Conference? Any of our panelists may unmute and tackle the question. It's an excellent one to end on. I'm just going back to the last question, uh, and I'd like to pick up something that Olivia mentioned uh, about the, the constant push for people to have more. Uh, I think that's a very strong part of, of the global culture and the global system that's been uh, shared around the planet. And, and the politicians, are part of it as, as well as the rest of us. And so I think what that issue is something that we really have to uh, address strongly within the, the global culture. The whole thing of wanting better and more all the time and growth, the language of constant growth uh, has to be challenged. Um, and the beauty of enough, uh, as one poet has put it, is something that we we need to promote. That's probably a final word as well.
Thank you, Sister Wendy. We have time for one more response from panelists if anyone would like to. Cardinal Mafia, I see your hand. Please unmute and take the floor. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm not to put it, putting into words, but uh, the idea of conversion kept coming to me, as others mentioned, which links to other concepts or idea too. People mentioned the blindness, others mentioned the heart. I think they all related. Uh, therefore, I, I tend to, to see, uh, as I say, someone can articulate in a better English. There seem to be a, a lot of movement, things that the pace is quick. Uh, so the idea of pause is why the meritorium ideas. I think the world needs um, slow down and pause and think because they are very much driven by something in the heart that is missing, uh, you know, the two has to go together. I, I normally refer to the mind as, a, as an altar and the heart is like the temple. It's the temple that is very, very impoverished these days. It's, miss, you know, which connect to love, respect and awe, reverence and so forth. This is really missing. And then when we talk about the heart, of course, that's when we see silence and, and there they need to be a pause. Our pace in this world is so quick. It's a, and, and if our heart is filled with greed and all this, um, it will, of course, will be driven by this. So that's why the language uh, side that others mentioned, it's uh, to me the big challenge for church now is, is how to gain the hearts of others. So I thought of this great man of today. We're still here in Tonga. The St. Peter and Paul Fish Day was yesterday. What makes a change the world by Paul? He wasn't educated much, you know, when in his conversion in the way to Damascus, he changed the world, the whole Gentile world. And what was the secret he had? It's a sincere conversion. And the language for, from a sincere converted person, which is the urgent call to me in the world today, it has a natural powerful influence. This is what is lacking. We may come up with slogans and beautiful words, skills in methodology and coming together thoughts. We'll keep on recycling unless we will have a, a sincere feeding of the, the heart. I know. This kind of language, you know, one that is not liked by minded, oriented people and, and so forth. I'm not putting that down, but so I'm thinking, resonating around that idea, and perhaps others will put in a nice way to give it to Father Paul. And this is our suggestion or, um, to, you know, it's the heart, the conversion. We need saints. We need saints. And saints, when they speak, it changes the heart of people. Thank you. Thank you, Cardinal Mafi, for that call to cultivate our hearts as well as our minds and spirits and for us all to be saints. And unfortunately, on that note, it is time for us to conclude. I want, there's always more to say than we have time to say, particularly with such an illustrious room full of speakers. I want to remind all of our observers that any questions you place into the chat or any comments made in the chat will be sent to each of our panelists. They will have a chance to respond uh, via email if they would like to do so. And then to all registrants, the link to this recording as well as any additional resources or replies will be shared afterwards. Um, our faith guides us to care for each other and may we all be good neighbors and good stewards of this planet as we move forward. I want to extend a deep and warm gratitude to each of our speakers once again for sharing your insight and your moral call to action today. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our event sponsors as well. May our efforts to save the oceans be blessed. And I bid you all farewell and a wonderful day from the banks of the Tagus River here in Lisbon. May the proceedings of the UN Ocean Conference be blessed. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, Reference James. <laughs> yeah, you're still thank there. You thank you, everyone. Thank you for continue. the invitation. Yeah, we wow, continue. Wow, to, wow. Yeah, yeah. We'll continue to, to talk about this issue, and I think we will contact you again in the, in the uh, thank next you. Week. Thank, thank you, you, Olivia, for your perspective. You, you are the representative of the youth for the future generation. <laughs> generation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. We're down to 11 people in the room, so I'm going to close the meeting. My heart is so full. Thank you, thank you so much thank for you. everything today. Thank you so much, Blair. God bless you. Thank you, everyone. All right, closing the meeting in three, two, one.